Hello everyone, my name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all. I am so excited because this is a video that I've never done on my channel before. We are going to do a script doctor 450 shades of gray. We're going to be using an internet friendly numbered list to do it. Now, with that being said, I do want to shout out Jenny Nicholson, whose video that was a script doctor on Fifty Shades Darker, I watched while I was writing this one, and it was super funny because I realized how many of the same things we thought in terms of things to change in the entire franchise, and like, hey, maybe we can do a video together about changing the whole franchise. I don't know, but we have a lot of the same ideas, and I think this will definitely work to make the Fifty Shades franchise a lot better. So let's go ahead and get into it. The first one I think we need to do is change the freaking name. Fifty Shades of Grey is a stupid pun <laughs> and it's not even really that funny. It doesn't make sense and I think we really need to call back to the roots of the erotica genre that this is a part of. They all have names like The Seduction, the boss. We need to keep it really simple so everyone knows exactly what they are getting from the title. I propose we call it Mommy for a Billionaire. The title will make sense as we go through this numbered list, I promise, but I think that is the best way to start is by just scrapping the name. Number two is a bold move, but I think we need to get rid of it as a trilogy. Just ax the last two movies. It was started as a fan fiction. It's not really that well structured. And I think in order to really make this franchise the best it could possibly be, we have to treat it as though the first movie is the only movie and just set it up really strong to stand alone as its own work. Number three is recasting Jamie Dornan. Somehow Jenny and I have the exact same idea about this because we both know exactly who Christian Grey should be played by. Apparently Jamie Dornan played a serial killer in one of the last series he was in before this franchise and if they would have leaned into the whole kind of creepy erotic thriller aspect of this series I think that could have worked but he does not work for Fifty Shades as it is now. He does not work for it in my rewrite. So we are gonna have Henry Cavill instead. Okay, hear me out. He has this wonderful sort of like boyish all-American charm about him despite being from like the Isle of Jersey or somewhere. And I think he can really flirt that line between like aggressively attractive male model like CEO boss type and then also kind of like again that boyish all-American kind of like quarterback football player charm. I mean, the man played Superman. What else could you possibly want from him, okay? I think it makes total sense for what we're gonna be doing with this franchise. Which is number four, it's not about Christian Grey being the Dom anymore. I know, okay. This is where we get into the really radical retelling of Fifty Shades of Grey. It's basically not even gonna be in the same franchise anymore, to be honest. And the reason for this is I think we see over and over again in the franchise that what Christian needs, what he actually really wants, is somebody to take care of him, right? He has a very traumatic childhood, he was adopted, you know, he needs somebody to kind of play that loving caretaker role for him. And so what I think would be way more interesting and something that none of the main mainstream movies featuring BDSM have done before is that we have him look for a mommy, okay? That's where we get the title sequence, right? Mommy for a billionaire. This is where it all comes in, right? Because this is the great tool of story writing, you know? It's internal conflict. He thinks he has to be a dom because of how he was socialized as what he was told he needed to be, but his secret desire, his want, is for a mom. I mean, he has conflict about what he thinks he has to be and what he really wants that fulfills him. And so what we do instead is we have him be like really involved in like the high society BDSM circles of the Seattle kink community. It's kind of like an open secret that he's kinky. It's not like this like deep dark thing anymore, but he has kind of an odd reputation. He's really secretive about what his fetishes and kinks are. He doesn't really play in public that much but he has a reputation as like an amazingly skilled player, a really, really, really great dominant that everybody wants to play with because he is at such a high skill level, but is very private and very hard to get to know, and he very rarely takes on new partners. And so I think we can still have him being like kind of controlling and jealous in the way that a lot of people 
for some reason find appealing but it's not just because he's a dick for the sake of being a dick it's because he's really really private and protective over his secret need for a mommy and he's really scared of anybody finding that out so he just projects this really like asshole persona to avoid anybody actually getting close enough to him to reveal that. And of course as well we need to reevaluate Anna's character so number five is Anna actually knows what the fuck is going on this time. The, the biggest issue with Anna's whole character is that she had no idea what was going on, right? She didn't really know what sex was, she was a virgin, she had no idea what BDSM was, and she's so confused by everything, she doesn't understand what Christian's wants are, and so I think to make that relationship work better, we have it so she actually knows something about BDSM. We have her still be like a young, you know, recently graduated college student. She was involved in the scene in Portland. She was actually a submissive herself still. She did kink with maybe a couple of boyfriends, but she was never really able to find anybody who satisfied all of her needs. And she moves to Seattle. She gets a job at the publishing company and she hears about Christian at some of the BDSM clubs, kind of in like hushed whispers about like, ooh, it's the Christian Grey, he's so amazing. Oh my God, I heard so-and-so got to play with him once and it was the best night of her life, you know? And she's really impressed by that because again, nobody in the Portland scene was able to satisfy her needs. And so she's thinking, ah, Christian Grey, he's the Dom I want. He's the true Domly Dom, I'm gonna go after him. Little does she know about his whole inner mommy conflict. And I think at the same time, we should also make her more materialistic because that's like one of the only good things about dating Christian Grey is the fact he has a ton of money. So I think we make her like a little bit more money motivated. And so not only is there sort of this kink drive, but also a drive towards like, ooh, you know, Christian Grey is gonna be this gateway into this like luxury lifestyle and he'll buy me a car and he'll buy me a boat. Like she actually wants all of those things but she acts very demure and shy about it. So she does have a little bit of kind of that surface level, oh no, Christian, how could you? But it's very superficial this time as opposed to her genuinely being upset when he buys her things. And Christian just doesn't pick up on this at all for whatever reason. It's just totally outside of his frame of reference that like somebody would try to use him for his money in that way. And so he is just completely unaware of her more conniving ways. And at the same time, maybe we can also throw in that like maybe she has like an ex Dom in Portland who like is threatening to reveal her secret of like using Christian for money or wanting to use him for money. And maybe she has like a bad reputation in the scene because she just leaves dominance in like a pile behind her or something, you know, we can have some kind of threat maybe come from Portland. Cause I feel like that was something that was potentially missing as a plot thread in the last movie. All right, number six, and I think this is gonna be kind of controversial, but I think we keep Elena and this is how we do it, right? So Elena originally is this older woman, a family friend of Christian's adopted parents who seduces him as a 15 year old and introduces him to BDSM. We can kind of play on that a little bit, I think, and this is how we would do it, right? So we have Elena, rather than being like a late middle-aged family friend, she's like his former babysitter. Like she was like an older teenager when he was a baby and he was adopted by his adoptive parents. And so she was really like, the first one who sort of nurtured him and took care of him, you know, maybe she was even a little bit more of a nanny, maybe not even so much a babysitter, where like she changed his diaper, she sang him lullabies, rocked him to sleep, like all this affection that he never had from anybody else. And because his parents are freaking lawyers and like a doctor in Seattle, like they don't have time to read him bedtime stories. Like, no, we have the babysitter, we have the nanny do it. And so he gets really, really attached to her. He sort of like has this like puppy love crush on her and this is sort of the catalyst of his eventual need for a mommy you know originates in that sort of nanny babysitter role that Elena now plays. Number seven is just a personal pet peeve of mine which is um everyone needs hobbies or at least they need to do their freaking jobs. We hear nothing <laughs> in the movie, but the fact that like Christian Grey is like this powerful CEO who runs this super successful giant corporation. He's, he's so young, but he makes so much money. And what we actually see and what we read in the books is him constantly fucking off all the time at work, sexting his girlfriend on company dime, using his personal assistance to buy random women flowers and all sorts of other stuff. Like we never actually see him doing his job outside of 
reading reports that other people have read and barely paying attention during meetings because he's so distracted by Anna. I think what we need to do instead is we have Christian be like an actual complete workaholic. Not just like, oh man, I work so hard. I was at the office for like five hours yesterday. Like we have him hardcore be super, super driven and dedicated at work. And that can be a source of conflict between Anna and Christian because she wants to get closer to him. He's unavailable. He's busy all the time. Maybe he cancels plans for work things as opposed to the other way around like it is in the original Fifty Shades of Grey series. And he sort of uses work as a crutch so he doesn't have to get close to people. He's kind of more of that avoidant personality type where work is a convenient shield that keeps him protected from people getting too close. And I think as well, we should have him be into some hobbies. I think he should be into Minecraft. I think that would be hilarious and brilliant. And if we are going in the direction of him needing a mommy, of him being a little and having these sorts of interests, Minecraft makes total sense. So he just does work and Minecraft and that's all he wants but he also wants a mommy so he has to find a way to kind of fit all that in there. All right number eight is we have to change the conflict. Oh my god the conflict in the original series was just it's, it's a whole pile of nothing. The conflict is about like Christian needs this. He needs this and they fight about the contract and they fight about doing BDSM and they fight about having a romantic relationship. Boring. Get rid of it. Over. Done. Not even a problem in this movie whatsoever. I think what we do instead is we have the conflict again. We have it centered around Christian thinking he should be a dominant but really needing a mommy having that internal conflict. Having the conflict between Anna and Christian being that he's a workaholic and he won't let her get close. Her secretly wanting to use him for money and all of that kind of coming to a head together over the course of this new movie that we're writing. And maybe this conflict is even harder for him because maybe in the past when he was at Harvard, because he actually graduated this time, he didn't just drop out to start a company. Maybe when he was at Harvard, he had like a really, really close girlfriend because Harvard actually does have like a club, like a munch club at their school for kinky people. So he could absolutely meet somebody kinky at Harvard. All right, my camera battery died. Where were we? Ah, yes, Harvard. So we have him finish going to Harvard instead of dropping out. And while he's there, he has his first long-term girlfriend and they're both kinky because as it turns out, Harvard does actually have a club on campus for kinky people. Love to see it. That would be a great way to meet some fellow like-minded BDSMers. And while he's in that relationship with her, they start out in sort of that more traditional DS dynamic. And then he starts to kind of reveal more of his feelings of wanting to be taken care of and that kind of thing. And he tries to kind of frame it in a way where it's like, oh, this is like a service to me, right? And she totally picks up on it and is like, you know, I don't want to be your mommy. I don't want to take care of you. That's gross. That's disgusting. That's not how dominant should be. Is that how men should be? Like some really just like <laughs> nasty dismissive stuff. And because of that relationship, that just makes him feel even more like closed off and protective. But maybe over the course of their relationship, Anna starts to pick up on some of those signs. She starts to kind of pick up on the fact that he's not really being honest about what he truly is because in their relationship, he does act like a dominant. He's not treating her like future mommy material. He kind of has that conflict inside, but he definitely doesn't want it to leak out. But Anna picks up on it anyways. And maybe just to make things even more interesting, maybe Anna goes into the relationship being like, I'm not going to get attached. This is just about BDSM. This is about money. It's not about love. It's not about any of that. And maybe over the course of time, when she starts to see that vulnerability, she starts to fall for him too. Now, number nine, of course, is um, how do we actually have this mommy thing play out? Because I mentioned it a couple times, but I haven't really gone into detail about it, right? We know from the previous movies that he's obviously this big CEO billionaire. He loves toys, right? He loves planes. He loves cars. He loves anything with a motor in it, essentially. He loves helicopters. And I think we can totally lean into that. Those are kind of like his big extension of his kind of little preferences, right? Like maybe he collects like uh, antique Hot Wheels or maybe he is really into Legos, he likes building things. And actually we did see in one of the movies that Anna buys him a helicopter model as a present and he is totally into it, he loves it. And so I think we can also have that be in this movie where he's super into like building models and has like a big, like a toy train thing and actually, ooh, 
both Jenny and I thought about this. Actually, everybody thought about this. Everybody thought about Christian Grey in Trains, okay? It just, it makes sense. It makes sense. So, we don't see him interact with Trains at all in the original franchise, and I think we have to make that a thing here. There is an excellent bit from the Late Late Show where the Red Room is actually like, a big like model train station and it has all of these like antique train parts and everything else and maybe how we could have that set up is like he does actually have like the red room he has now because honestly the red room in the movie is pretty dope not all the furniture makes sense to me but it's definitely very high class it's very luxurious i think what we do is we have a bookshelf like on the back and he's kind of like a cartoon villain because like kid little brain you know and maybe there's like a, a book you pull out of the shelf or like when you open up and there's like a button inside and if you press that it like flips around and that reveals like his secret little room right because again he's not very open about it he's literally a closeted little so we have it be basically in a closet and he has this big whole secret room where he has all of his collector's hot wheels and his model train set and everything else that he collects that's little related you know and maybe anna like finds it by mistake when she's like cleaning the house or maybe they get in an argument and she storms off and is like throwing books off the bookshelf and then she picks up the wrong one by accident oh no she pressed the button ah my secrets are revealed like it can definitely be really cheesy this is like an erotica romance novel like it's not necessarily going to make the most sense but it is going to be a wild ride and when she finds it that can be like a really big conflict where she's like oh my god i can't believe you lied to me i don't understand this what is this you know it just ends up in like a big fight right because people love the fight I love seeing them fighting for some reason it doesn't make sense to me but that can be another source of conflict where like he's like Anna you don't understand me and she's like I don't know what I'm supposed to be understanding what is this why did you lie to me Christian this isn't what I wanted in our relationship I don't understand you know and they just go back and forth right and then they end up maybe that's where like they have a break for a couple days where like Christian isn't sure what happens he feels rejected Anna's not sure what happened he doesn't know why he lied like and eventually they end up getting back together and maybe they you know tell the story about the ex-girlfriend at Harvard and blah 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 and I think leading up to that point we could also very easily like weave in a couple of scenes where like he as the dominant has kind of convinced himself that it's like okay to have Anna do kind of more caretaking mommy type things because it's service submission she's helping me from a place of service it's not a mommy thing she's not my caretaker while well, she's like scrubbing him in the bathtub and reading him a bedtime story you know that kind of stuff because we have seen again in the existing movies they have things where she feeds him ice cream we have scenes where they bathe each other right we can just take those same scenes put them in this movie and then change them just a little bit to give them more of that ds flavor versus like kind of bland sex scene you know now number 10 i already mentioned this but we absolutely have to keep the model helicopter gift the whole reason i'm even rewriting this as a mommy little story is because those things are already there in the text okay it just it's there it's plain as day it just needs to be amped up like two more degrees for it to make complete sense he says things like, I don't know if I should spank you or worship at your feet, right? Or that really pivotal moment when he like slumps down on his knees and kneels before her. All of those things could be things that we put in this movie that we, again, we just recontextualize them a little bit. We amp up the BDSM flavor a little bit. Again, get that flavor knob, turn it up. And that would absolutely work for making it seem more like he's really the one who wants to submit as opposed to being the dominant. And I really think the key to this is having that right performance from people with that sort of boyish charm like Henry Cavill. I think we can actually even keep uh, Dakota Johnson if we want to, assuming she doesn't get drunk on set because she doesn't hate the directors and, and hate everyone else there the whole time. So I think if we can keep those together. We can definitely keep this in a very like playful fun little way even if it's really the same material as the other movies rather than being like adult vanilla-ish sex scene kind of way number 11 is how the hell do we even end this train wreck anyways so in the original first movie there's a really great parallel that's set up between the very beginning and the very end of the movie where they are both in the elevator and they say christian anna and at the end it's christian anna you know, they call back and forth to each other to really kind of bookend the whole movie. And I think we can have a very similar thing happen in this version as well. So the catalyst for the end of that movie is Anna's like, how bad can it get? Show me how bad it gets. And then 
he shows her and then she gets really upset about it and is like you're a monster i don't understand this i'm leaving bye and then she runs away and i think instead of that what we do is that same scene happens but rather than it being like anna not understanding the bdsm thing it's about her testing him to see if he's dumb enough for her to be like oh how bad can you actually do this can you meet the level of my masochism can you actually meet my needs and how we have this scene go instead is that christian can't actually keep up with her she's too much of a masochist for him because by that point he's gotten more emotionally attached to her he's kind of started to visualize her more as a mommy or a dominant figure for him and so he mentally cannot hit her as hard as she wants him to and so he actually has a little bit of a breakdown during the scene when she's kind of bratting a little bit and trying to egg him on and be like is that all you've got and he's like yeah that's all I've got I can't hate you I'm so sorry and like she actually has to stop and comfort him and they end the scene kind of on a point of like him finally confessing that like I can't hit you uh because I see you as my mommy or something along those lines where he finally has this really deep emotional confession about who he really is and how he sees their relationship and the direction he wants it to go it in and she can't handle that she doesn't know how to take that she's like I don't know if I can give you what you want that doesn't sound the kind of relationship I can be in and then she decides to leave after that and it's a very like emotional tearful thing where they're both kind of sad about leaving the relationship because Christian really was starting to care for her Anna was starting to care for him as well despite the fact she was really originally in it for the money and for getting her BDSM needs met and I think that would just be a good way to end it based on the material that we already have kind of in the franchise and would be very satisfying. And those are all the suggestions that I have for the first of the Fifty Shades franchise. Again, I want to give a shout out to Jenna Nicholson and her Fifty Shades Darker Script Doctor because it was so hilarious and it was super funny to see how many things that we had kind of similar ideas about. If you would like me to do this for the other movies or a different franchise, please let me know your comments, thoughts, questions, other additions. You can go ahead and leave down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this, if you want to see more from me, please do subscribe. I make videos twice a week about all sorts of kink and BDSM related topics. And finally, if you want to support what I do, the best way you can do that is through patreon a link to that will be down in the description box below and if you do already support me over there thank you so so much it means the absolute world to me and until i see you guys next time i hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week Bye bye